Your work is a life to all who hear and obey. Your word endures forever. Great. Well, if you've um, got a Bible, do turn back to Exodus chapter 40. That would be really uh, helpful this morning. This brings us to the end of a series that we've been going through um, in Exodus. We've been looking at the second half of Exodus uh, this year. In the last year we looked at uh, the first uh, 20 um, uh, chapters of uh, Exodus. And I don't know about you, but um, as we read that, but at first glance, you know, I think the ending of Exodus is a, a little bit of an anticlimax. Now Moses has, he's finished building uh, the tabernacle, we're told he does it um, exactly as God said it should be done. Then this cloud comes and descends on the tabernacle. God's glory fills it. Moses can't go into it. And then the cloud lifts and, they, and descends and the people walk around. At first it seems like a little bit of an anti-climax. Through the, the first half of the book chapters, 1 to 20, they seem full of action, don't they? Do you remember the Moses and the burning bush? Um, we see um, Moses going and then God sending all these signs on the pharaohs and the Egyptians, the, the amazing uh, plagues that come. They see uh, the water being parted, the Israelites walking through the dry land and then it coming back and covering the Egyptians. We uh, see the water from the rock. And then we get to uh, Mount Sinai and there's pyrotechnics in the sky around the mountain. God uh, speaks to the people and then the Israelites um, make the golden calf. It seems like full of action. But you get to chapter 40, right at the end, and sometimes it can feel just a little bit, what's going on here? Why, why is this at the end? As I've looked at that this, this week, I think I've come to realise that this is actually, these just few verses at the end are a very significant ending for us. And I hope that this morning we might come to feel some of that as well. It's so significant because in this we see the glory of God. And the glory of God is something which is very, very significant for us. Now, the glory of God has been a theme through uh, the whole of the book of Exodus. But here, right at the end, the book finishes on this note about the glory of God. And so, first, we need to uh, step back and think what glory uh, means. I don't know about you, do you not find this sometimes? Maybe we've, we've sung about glory this morning a number of times in our song, uh, songs. Um, but sometimes glory, it seems one of those words, when you actually start to think, like, what, does, what does glory actually mean? What does God's glory actually mean? It feels like it's a little bit hard to pin down. It's a bit of a, an elusive concept. It kind of slips out of your, your grasp as you try to kind of put a handle on it. Well, I hope that we can maybe just try to um, think about that a little bit this morning and see something of uh, the amazing thing that the glory of God um, is. And so you could start by uh, thinking about what the, the, the Hebrew word is translated here, uh, glory means. It's the, the word kavod in, in Hebrew, in the, which the Old Testament was written in. And literally it means something which is heavy, which is substantial, which is full of substance. And so when we read glory here, the, the glory of the Lord, God's glory, is the, the weightiness of his divine being. It speaks of the full perfections of his being. In every way, God is, God's presence is perfect. There is nothing lacking in his character. All his characteristics are perfect, and so they are, they are weighty. They are substantial. The glory of God is something which is weighty and substantial. And through the book of Exodus, what we've come to see is that the glory of God, this substantial thing, this weighty thing, is linked to his character. It's linked to his a character, to his name. Do you remember, we looked at it last week, around the golden calf incident in chapter 33, Moses, after this petition with God, he says to God, show me your glory. And God says that he would do that. And what happens? Do you remember, Moses is he's put in the cleft of the rock, God covers him in the cleft of the rock, and God passes by, 
And he shows his glory, but he does it by declaring his name. Do you remember? He declares his glory by saying, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sins of the parents to the third and fourth generation. God's glory is seen in his name. God's name reveals his character. And so as you get to know God's name, as you get to know God's character, you begin to see more and more of his glory. And so it links with that sense of his perfection, of his substance, of the, the weightiness of his being. He is perfect in every characteristic that he has. And while the, I think the high point of the, the declaration of God's glory was in the chapter 34 when he makes that declaration, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, it's revealed right the way through Exodus, isn't it? That's why we call uh, this series, Behold Our God. You see, we see God, uh, the one who is glorious, he is sovereign, he is in control of all things. So think of some of the amazing things that God's been able to do in, in Exodus, which reveals who he is. He was able to send those uh, signs on Egypt, the turning the water into blood and the, the gnats and all the rest of it. He was able to part the Red Sea so the Israelites could walk through and dry land. He was able to cause the water to come back so that they, it fell over the Egyptians. He was able to provide water from the rock in the desert so that the Israelites could drink. He provided food from heaven for them to eat. God is sovereign and in control. We also see, haven't we, through Exodus, that God is a God who makes promises, serious promises. That God doesn't forget his promise. When he makes a promise, God keeps his promises. He will never turn away from his promises. And even when we might look around the world and think, what is going on? I can't see how this is fulfilling your promises. We see God keeping his promise. We see that he is a God of absolute justice and his justice is perfect. So he can judge Pharaoh for the, the hardness of his heart and the evil which he committed in Egypt. He could bring his justice on Israel who made the golden calf and rebelled against him. As we read, he doesn't leave the guilty unpunished. He's a God of um, utter holiness and purity. He is the God who is loving and kind, who is gracious and compassionate, who forgives wickedness, rebellion and sin. He is the God who creates relationships with his people. And you see, that's God's glory. God's character is who he is and it is glorious and when we think about that one of the dangers I think that we have is that we often try to uh, reduce God the God God is so vast he is so uh, infinite so amazing that it's almost hard to comprehend who God is and so sometimes we try to reduce it and in doing that we actually reduce God and so, I don't know if you've had conversations like this with people, some, you're talking to somebody and people say, I like to think of God as, and they fill in the blank, and then on the other hand, um, but I could never follow a God that is, and then they fill in the blank again. So the most, the kind of classic one is, isn't it? I like to think of God as loving and forgiving, but I could never follow a God who judges. But can you see what, they, what happens when we do that? We are reducing God. God has shown in Exodus that he is. He is loving, kind, forgiving. And yet he doesn't hold the guilty. Um, he doesn't kind of let the guilty go. We can't reduce the character of God. We can't pick and choose. God's glory is his total character. Now, in a sense, I can understand why we try to re re reduce God, because it's often where we start. So we, might be, we might become attracted to the idea of God. We, when we discover, actually, we think, actually, no, I realise there is a God out there, a God who is real, who exists. Now, people instinctively know, don't they, that there's more to life than just what we see around us in our day-to-day -day life. 
Maybe it's as they climb the mountains, you know, and you get that, that view at the top, and it's just it's, it's amazing. Or you see the glorious uh, sunset over the sea, and, and you get this sense of awe that, that, that God is out there, that there's something bigger than us. Or when someone sees you know, the whale breaching next to the boat, and it kind of comes up and lands, and they're, they're just filled with awe. Or out in the darkness in the night sky and look up and there's, there's millions upon millions of stars and they say, I can see there must be more to this world. God must exist. So as the psalmist says into Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they reveal knowledge. The people can start to kind of see something of the glory of God. And that idea can be attractive, and so they naturally start to, to build their own ideas of what God is like. How we, how we think God must be like, how we would like God to be. They want God who will help them when things are tough. They want a God who will look after our loved ones. A God who will affirm and accept us. You know, that's often where we start, isn't it? We, we have this kind of general picture, general impression of God. But when you then start to investigate what God is actually like, and you come to his word, you begin to see that those descriptions and those thoughts of God that you might have formed are small, are weak, might, and might even be wrong. And we begin to see that God is much more glorious than we might have thought. And that might be hard for us at first. So you might, it might be that you know, you've, you've come to this idea and you think, well, actually, I, I, I can see that God might provide a good addition to my life. But as you investigate, you discover that, that God is not just a general concept, but that he is real and true. That he says he will not, that he will hold the guilty as guilty. He will punish wickedness and sin. And you begin to realise that you are unworthy before him. That you're spiritually small. That how can you come into the presence of such a glorious God? Can you see as you start to understand who God is, it, it, it changes who you are. Or it might be that you come to, you think, well, I, 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 I'd like this idea of God, but as you come to see the, the weightiness and the perfection of God, it's unsettling because you see that God's revealed himself to you. And this God has a will and he has desires and he has standards who define who people are. And you realise that your cherished desire to be the one who is free and who defines yourself is no longer possible. Because this God is bigger and more glorious than you could possibly have imagined. But when we start to investigate who God is, as we start to see who his, what his character is like, as we come to see his glory, we can reduce him, confine him, put him into a box. We can't mould God into our own ideas. We have to let God be who he is. We need to see God in his glory. <coughs> and God's glory is who God is. It's his character. And we have to hold on to that, not reducing it to our plans and ideas. And that, this a sense of God's glory, this weightiness of his being, is the perfection of his character, the, the, the breadth of his character, is something which we need. So we need the glory of God. That's why it's the appropriate ending at the end of Exodus, because we need the glory of God. Do you remember, again, thinking back to last week, what we saw uh, last week, Moses intercedes with God after the golden calf incident. He uh, reminds God of his character. And at the beginning of chapter 33, it might be, it might be helpful actually just to to see this, if you've got your Bible, flip, flip back a few pages to Exodus 33. Verses 1 to 3. This is after the golden calf, after the people have rebelled against God. God says to Moses, Leave this place, you and the people you brought up out of Egypt, and go to the land I swore on... The land I promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, 
I will give it to your descendants. I will send an angel before you and drive out the Canaanites, Amorites, Hittites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. Go up to the land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go with you because you are a stiff-necked people and I might destroy you on the way. You see what, what's going on here? God's saying after they've rebelled against God, uh, there's one, one preacher, teacher, um, said that an American guy was saying, no, at this point, it's as if God is promising people the American dream. He says, he says I'm, I'm saying it half tongue in cheek, but it actually makes a serious point. Because you see what God is saying here? He says, look, I'm going to give you a land flowing with milk and honey, a, an abundant land, a, a land where you can have everything that you want, where be, you'll be well provided for, where you'll be safe. But God says, I won't go with you. And tongue, tongue in cheek, the preacher says, I know what people want. All the blessings from God, but none of his presence. None of the maintaining a relationship with him. All the stuff, but, but we can kind of hold him at arm's length. But you see, Moses and the people, you see in verse 4 there, the people are distressed. They mourn. You see, it might have seemed like they were going to get everything they wanted. They get all the stuff. But they realise if God is not with them, then then what is the point? They're distraught at the thought. And then Moses um, petitions God about this. He, in effect, he says, look, it would be better if we just died here in the wilderness, if you're not going to go with us, if your glory, your presence is not going to be with us. Look at verse 15. Moses said to him, if your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. In effect, let us die here. How will anyone know that you're pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me from your people? And uh, distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth. See, Moses and the people, they recognise living life without God would be meaningless, pointless, a life not worth living. You see, Moses recognised he needs God with him, with the people. He needed the glory of God. He needed the, the presence of God. He needed his face. Do you remember his presence, his face, his character? He needed God to be with him. He needed the glory of God to be with him. So Moses says, show me your glory. And God shows his glory, his character, and his presence. And God makes a way for uh, it be possible that he might live uh, amongst them. Do you know what Moses shows us is, is that actually we need the glory of God. It's the glory of God which brings the, the promise of hope, of beauty, of delight. It's the glory of God which brings uh, the thought that this world has meaning and purpose. It's the glory of God which shows that the, this, this world, the stuff that we see around us is not it. That there is more to life. There's something bigger and better that we all need, and it's God's presence in our life. And so we will resist the world's insistence that this world is all that there is. This world says, no, people say, isn't it? This world is it. So make the most of it. Try, in effect, try and make heaven on earth for yourself now thinking that you can find ultimate meaning and purpose and blessing just from the things around us. And as Christian people, sometimes we can be seduced by that as well. So we think we can bring heaven on earth. And whether it's the experiences, you know, going to the, the tropical beach and people describe it as a slice of paradise, it's like heaven on earth. And we think, well, if I can have all those, then that'll be a great thing for me. Or maybe for others, it's walking the, the European streets and seeing the, the history and the culture and the amazing buildings. Yeah, for others, it's building your career, isn't it? You think, yeah, building my career, whether it's to make a, a name for myself or to help other people, uh, pushing the organisation forward, that's what life's all about. That will bring heaven on earth. Or it's in your family. Or it's creating your home with a Scandi chic or shabby chic, or um, that's about my, the limit of my chics. 
But you know, we, we, we invest in our homes thinking that will bring the meaning and the significance. That will bring the delight. That will bring what we want. And so we put our energies into those things. Thinking it will bring heaven on earth. And there's much in our culture, isn't it, which is done to foster that kind of belief for us. Social media, with the algorithms, will give you the ads which will foster what you think heaven and earth is going to look like. And so you see it every day and then you start to believe it. And our imaginations follow along those lines. We give our time to it, we give our money to it, and we think that's where it's going to be. But it never brings what we think it should. Because we've replaced the glory of God with something else. Moses knew that he needed that glory. Which is why when you get to chapter 40, in verse 34, the cloud covers the tent of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle that is such a significant moment. Because here is God, the irreducible God, coming to live among his people. Coming to live in that, that tabernacle, that place among them, so that God's glory could be seen, so that they could have a, a way back into the presence of God that sin had broken. The glory of God is such an important thing for us. And so, one of the responses I've had this week is to be praying, God, show me your glory. Let me see your glory more clearly. Think that I wouldn't settle for trying to make heaven on earth. That I'd be pushing forward to know God's glory in a deeper and more significant way. Learning to enjoy him and delight in him. And finding that in him, he brings meaning to all other things. But the question is, how do we do that? How do we, how do we see God's glory now? We don't have the tabernacle. We don't go to the temple. So how do we see God's glory? I think the first point is to see that Exodus is not the end of the story. We end with the glory coming down. But you see in verse 35, Moses couldn't enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled on it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. The God's glory is so substantial, it's so weighty, so perfect, so holy, so pure, that he couldn't actually get in. Yet the glory of God was suffocating for him in that sense. And it points to the fact that this wasn't the end of the story. That there was more to come. And the end of the story begins with Jesus. We say that all the way through Exodus, haven't we? That the Exodus was really just a shadow of what was to come when Jesus came. The Exodus reveals God's glory. It shows us of God's glory as we see his substantial weighty character. But it demonstrates that there's more to come and it comes with Jesus. And so when Jesus arrived, you remember at the beginning of uh, John's uh, Gospel, we find that um, John tells us that Jesus came and tabernacled among us. He dwelt among us. So John 1.14 says this, The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. And what happened? We have seen his glory. The glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. You want to know the glory of God? You want to see the glory of God? Look to Jesus. The Son who came from the Father, who is full of glory. And you can focus in even more, because it's interesting, the next place, really, that the big language of glory comes is as Jesus is about to go to the cross. And he says it's on the cross that you will ultimately see the glory of God. Because on the cross you see God's character and what it leads to. But Jesus was glorified as he hung on a cross. And you see, you, you look at Exodus, and how, does God's, how can God's character, this, this full, perfect character, have both within it this absolute desire and will which will be gracious and compassionate and forgive sin, wickedness, and rebellion? 
But at the same time, have this absolute commitment not to leave the guilty unpunished. You think, how can that be? How can God's glorious character be glorious when it seems to have such a contradiction? When you look to the cross and you see wrath and mercy meet. As Jesus died in the place of sinners so that God could be both just, he will hold the guilty, guilty of their sin, and he will punish it. And he did that on Jesus. And at the same time, he is gracious and compassionate. God is absolutely forgiving, absolutely punishing, and it's brought together in Jesus. We see the glory of God. In the next uh, coming weeks, we're going to be uh, thinking about um, the doctrine of uh, the Spirit, who the Spirit is, the God is Father, Son, and Spirit. And in John's Gospel, one of the things that we see Jesus promising that the Spirit will do is glorifying Jesus. God gives his spirit so that we, he might glorify Jesus because we see in Jesus the glory of God. You see, it's in Jesus, it's in his gospel, it's in the message of that great gospel that he gives to us that we see God's glory. And so we pray, Father, let me know Jesus more. Let me see your glory more. Let me see the the infinite worth of Jesus and all that he's done for us. And we also pray, let me invest my time and my energy and my money in the glory of God in your gospel. It means what we do with our time and our money and our possessions will reflect whether we think the glory of God is so significant that we would give ourselves to it our time and our money and our efforts. We think what Jesus says, seek first his kingdom and where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The glory of God drives us. Are you desiring for the glory of God to be known in your own life but also in the lives of others? Are you putting your effort into the glory of God being known by you and by others? That glorious gospel which shows us Jesus. Of course it comes personally first, doesn't it? If we're not desiring to know God, if we're not desiring to see God's glory in a deeper way ourselves, then we're not going to invest in it. If we see church ministry as a duty to be performed rather than a way for me to see the glory of God and invest in others seeing it, then we won't do it. If we think of our money as our own, to be spent on our own lives now, building heaven on earth, then we won't joyfully give it away to see a gospel ministry grow and the glory of God spread as people come to see who he is in Christ. The glory of God is amazing. It reveals the God who is there, his weighty, substantial character. And when we see this glory, we realise that God wants to be in a relationship with you. So that you may be with him forever. So that you can come into his actual presence. Not like Moses who couldn't quite get in because of the glory of God, but because of Jesus' death on the cross, making us perfect. Who draws us into God's presence where we will be with him forever. And we will see his glory and delight in that forever and ever. But did you see the last thing in Exodus? The cloud representing the glory of the Lord led the people. And so my my last point, just very briefly this morning, the glory of God leads. Do you see verse 36? In all the travels of the Israelites, whenever the cloud lifted from above the tabernacle, they would set out. But if the cloud did not lift, they did not set out until the day it lifted. So the cloud of the Lord was over the tabernacle by day and fire was in the cloud by night in the sight of all the Israelites during all their travels. The cloud represents the glory of God and it was the glory of God which then led them. They were in all their travels at the direction of the glory of God. And the same is true of us. Think of what Jesus says and he would send another advocate, another, another one like him who would help us And he says it will be the spirit of truth who will remain with us forever. 
Jesus says at the end of Matthew, no, surely I'll be with you until the end of the age. It's not an amazing privilege that the God of glory comes to dwell with us, live in us, to be with us forever, to never leave, and to guide us along the path of life until we are in his presence forever, until that time when he reunites heaven and earth. When Jesus comes back and where God reunites heaven and earth and where we will dwell with him in his new creation forever and ever. Dwelling in the presence of God. Delighting in his glory. It might be that while we wait and while we live our life now, we, we, we die on the way, but God promises that he won't leave us and that he will raise us up with new bodies on that last day. So whether we die before Jesus comes again or whether we are here when he comes, we will be with God in his glorious presence forever if we're trusting in Christ. And that's what should drive our lives now. Our glorious God who's substantial, weighty, perfect. The God whose character is full, irreducible, who makes sense of everything, whose glory is the goal of all things. Let me lead us in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we pray that we might see your glory more. We pray that we would learn more and more and more of your character and enjoy your presence as we understand who you are and what you've done for us. May we desire to see more of your glory and would you reveal more of your glory to us. And may your glory drive all that we do, we pray. For we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Your work is alive to all who hear and obey. Your word endures forever.